this presentation talks about fabricating the master cast and mounting the case. Every time we start a case, the doctor takes an impression and he sends the impression to us and we fabricate the, the casts and then we mount the case. That's standard procedure. Uh, also, we have to be careful that for the implant cases, uh, we have different options in terms of um, the, the tray, the impression tray. So as a preliminary work, the doctor may ask us to fabricate a custom tray for the case. And this is done mostly if the doctor decides to use an open tray for the case. Also, <clears throat> the custom trays fits better over uh, the patient's mouth and they are more accurate in terms of um, registering uh, the, the implant location and position. So we're going to start with fabricating the custom trays. Requirements for fabricating an implant custom trays are the same as those standard for dentures or for fixed custom tray. Uh, the tray must pro provide for patient comfort while maintaining a uniform thickness of impression material. Um, it is important when we decide to do the custom tray to keep in mind that <clears throat> we have to apply a thin layer of uh, wax if the patient has some uh, natural teeth over the, the teeth. So this thickness of the wax provides enough uh, room for the impression material. <clears throat> also, the custom tray must uh, provide the stable access to the area for impression copings, which register where the implants are positioned in the patient's mouth. Okay. Uh, depending on the impression copings used, not all uh, impressions are required to be open. So some of the trays, depending on, like I said, what the doctor decides, if it's a complex, complex case, the doctor might decide to do a custom tray and use impression copings for um, open tray because they're more stable okay, and they're more accurate. Also, um, closed tray uh, impression, it's used for implant cases where um, <clears throat> it needs to be accurate, but like a single unit where everything is pretty much close to ideal location of the implant, uh, that's um, uh, good to use uh, a closed tray impression. <clears throat> It's important also to note that um, when the doctor takes an impression on um, uh, with an open tray impression, the screw from the impression coping sticks out from the tray. So in order to remove the tray from the patient's mouth, the doctor has to unscrew the, the impression coping and then remove the tray from the patient's mouth. The following procedures describe an open impression tray with square impression copings and guide pins. Uh, impression copings that are removed from the impressions are recommended for increased accuracy. The open uh, custom tray for implant restoration, the dentist first makes, takes an alginate impression for the diagnostic cast. This is done with the healing caps in place on the abutments. The impression is poured and trimmed using the standard guide, guidelines for diagnostic cast. Also, we have to follow the dentist guideline for designing the tray and block out any significant undercuts. Uh, block out the area where the healing uh, abutments is very important because if we don't block out, the impression material gets caught in there and it might move the implant or in my move, in my um, <clears throat> distort um, the setting. 
using the dentist guidelines, apply the necessary amount of release to the tissue area to be impressed. Mix and apply custom tray material to the cast and cure it. The only difference is to leave an open area over the blackout that was applied to the healing abutments. After the material has cured, trim the tray to the design line and remove all the blackout material. Also, it's very important to note how we're going to do the tray, uh, how far we want to do the borders of the tray. Uh, also, we have to keep in mind to relieve the phenoms, right? These are very important landmarks. Um, also, how we um, design and attach the handle of the tray. So the handle has to be uh, positioned in the middle of the tray um, and kind of uh, perpendicular to the tray um, and not to be in the way of the lip. So always keep this in mind because if the patient is trying to close their mouth with the impression tray inside and the handle hits the lip, the, the patient won't be able to close their mouth. A custom tray provides the advantage of uniform thickness of impression material. A working cast is fabricated from a preliminary impression made to the indirect impression transfer coping after the stage two implant recovery. Um, and when the sutures are removed and uh, or uh, the first um, appointment for um, starting the um, restoration. When addition silicone is used for the preliminary impression, rather than irreversible hydrocolloid, the laboratory might put the impression at a later date. So it's very important to, uh, for the dentist to choose the correct impression material. Uh, especially for the implant cases, we want the impression material not only to be accurate, but also um, <coughs> either to uh, be stable so we can pour up the model if we need it once or twice or um, to not rip when we try to separate the impression from the cast. Um, also, it's, uh, it's very important to uh, select the right material for the custom tray so uh, we can choose acrylic we can choose a light curing uh, material to fabricate the trays. Um, many of the dental technicians today, they like to use the light curing material that comes in sheets because they have a uniform thickness and um, that uh, provides um, less work for the technician and a more accurate um, impression. fabricating the master cast. So uh, for depending what type of uh, restoration or prosthesis we do, for fixed prosthesis, we like to do a soft tissue material. So the soft tissue material, it's a silicone based material. And the purpose of doing this is to be able to remove the soft tissue from the master cast and to see the fit of the abutment and the prosthesis during the fabrication process. <clears throat> Accuracy of the master cast is the most important. Um, how we ensure that we have we achieve that um, import that important step. So like every impression that comes from the dentist, we have to disinfect the impression and then examine the impression copings for stability in the impression material. Also, we have to look for overflow the, of the impression material. Um, if there is any impression material inside or around the impression copings that will interfere with uh, um, attaching the replicas. If there are any um, extra material, extra impression uh, material, we can use a blade to remove um, the extra material, very little. 
Any excess material indicates the copings are not properly seated on the abutments during the impression procedure, and therefore the impression will need to be uh, retaken. So if we see or if we believe that uh, because the impression material was too much around the implant and maybe it pushed the, impl it pushed the impression copings and they're not in the same position, we can call the doctor and ask the doctor to retake the impression. Um, so once we examine the impression and we saw that the impression is good, and we saw that also the impression copings are stable inside the impression. Now we are ready to attach the replicas to the impression copings. The purpose of the replicas is to indicate into our master cast where the implants are, the location, the position, the angulation of the implants, exactly how they are in the patient's mouth. So we just copy what the patient has in their mouth into our model that we're going to work with to design and fabricate the final prosthesis. Um, to attach abutment replica for square impression copings with guide pins, remove the guide pins and gently blow air through the holes to remove the breeze. Sit an abutment replica on each of the impression copings and attach it with a guide pin. To attach an abutment replica for tapered impression copings, examine the tapered copings surface, imprint the impression for any debris or impression defects. Attach an abutment replica to each of the impression copings and then carefully seat the copings into the impression. Firmly seat each coping back into the impression before moving into pouring up the impressions. So the next step will be to fabricate the soft tissue. And the soft tissue material, like I said, it's a silicone-based material and it's an injectable material. So we can use a syringe to um, apply the soft tissue ma material around the uh, the replica and the uh, impression copings okay um, it's very important to not remove the soft tissue uh, from the impression before we pour it up in the stone so we um, we uh, attach the soft tissue to uh, the impression we let it set and then we're ready to pour up the impression in stone. Um, <clears throat> very important when we think about it, what kind of stone we can use for fabricating the soft tissue master cast, it's always indicated to use dye stone because dye stone is a little bit stronger stone and also it's most accurate. So <clears throat> again, when we start mixing the stone, um, use the manufacturing instructions for, for the powder water ratio and also for the uh, mixing um, instructions. Um, always use a vacuum mixer to mix the stone. And when we're ready to pour out the impression, always make sure that uh, we use a vibrator to pour up the stone but very carefully don't put the vibrator on high because that can move the impression copings with the replicas inside the, the impression. After the stone is set, we can separate the impression from the master cast and then we are ready to trim the master cast and um, ready to have it uh, for I have it ready for uh, articulating. <clears throat> so in this slide, we have a representation of open trays versus the closed trays. Uh, when we look at the impression copings for either one of them, we can see the difference. For the open tray, the um, screw for the impression copings is longer because it has to penetrate to the uh, custom tray. 
for the uh, closed tray, we can see that actually the screw is uh, smaller. It's not so long. And uh, the impression uh, coping with the screw, it's inserted in, into the impression material. So it doesn't penetrate the tray. <clears throat> There are some cases where we don't need to do soft tissue, and especially when we're talking about um, uh, a dentalus area, large dentalus area, it's not indicated to use the soft tissue uh, because that interferes with <laughs> the way we design the restoration. Also, for removable um, prosthesis, there are different types of impression copings and uh, having a soft tissue material that will interfere with the replicas for those impression copings for edentulous uh, cases. Um, <clears throat> also, we have to be careful and we have to keep in mind that when the, st the stone starts to set, it's expanding a little bit. So there are some changing during the expand, during the setting time. So we should never open the impression and separate the model, the master cast from the impression before the stone is completely set. Um, <clears throat> so there are different type of articulators that we use um, daily in the labs. Um, we have uh, articulators that um, are used uh, just for simple cases or articulators that are more complex and uh, mimic the patient's um, uh, movements and oral function. So an articulator, it's a mechanical instrument that represents the temporomandibular joint and jaws to which the maxillary and mandibular cast might be attached to simulate all or some of the mandibular movements. Articulator simulates the position and movement of the patient's lower jaw in relation to the upper jaw, so the prosthesis with the proper occlusal can be made. The accuracy of the simulation uh, depends on the accuracy of the dentist transfer records and the degree of the adjustability of the instrument. In other words, the accuracy of uh, how we mount the case and how correct the mounting is depend on how the dentist took the impression and the bite registration and also what uh, functions the articulator can perform. So the transfer records <laughs> um, are the following, the vertical and horizontal dimensions or orientation of the upper jaw to both temporomandibular joint. The patient actual centric relation, okay? The angles of articulated eminence from uh, that form the occlusal plane. The temporomandibular joint characteristics governing the trimming and detection of uh, lateral protrusion or lateral movement. The distance between patient's condyle or intercondylar distance and the relative presence or absence of anterior guidance. So all these movements, we uh, especially for implant cases, uh, are necessary to be registered, to be able to be registered with uh, the articulator that we're going to use for fabricating the prosthesis. There are different articulator categories, um, <clears throat> and there are obviously difference between them. So articulating having a full range of adjustments can be said to match the patient's guiding anatomical features. As a result, articulated movements come on very close to duplicating the patient's actually jaws movement. Articulators with no adjustments are built to move in a very um, generic manner and it cannot be set to be to register any other movements like the lateral movements okay based on the adjustability factor articulators fall into three broad categories non-adjustable semi-adjustable and fully adjustable 
Just because an articulator has minimal adjustability doesn't mean it is inferior. An articulator only becomes inferior when it's um, used before its cap capabilities. Okay, so for instance, if I use uh, a hinge articulator for a full mouth restoration, that articulator cannot do complex movements. Therefore, <laughs> that is not capable of um, giving uh, the technician the um, movement of the jaw that's necessary for establish the correct um, centric relation and um, occlusal contact. On the other hand, a fancy impressive articulator is still only a, ma a machine, um, <clears throat> but uh, a machine that has enough tools in there that can give us uh, the possibility to adjust the articulator to mimic exactly how the patient is moving their jaws. <clears throat> Um, the dental laboratory technicians should become intimately familiar how all types of articulator work in uh, order to develop the ability to match a job's demand to an articulator capabilities. So in other words, before you start to, you know, planning a case, just first of all, plan what kind of articulator you're going to use for that case. If it's a simple uh, one small filling that you need to do, then a hinge articulator, that's fine. A non-adjustable articulator, that's fine. If it's a full mouth rehabilitation case, then you need to use either a semi-adjustable or a fully adjustable articulator. So non-adjustable articulators, <coughs> they're different types. So we have the hinge type articulator, this variety is the simple simple one. It can make basic up, opening and closing movement, up and down. It has no ability to go into lateral or protrusive uh, excursion. Sometimes these devices are called holding instruments. Their only function is to hold or maintain the vertical and horizontal relationship between two casts at one mandibular position. Another type of non-adjustable articulator is the fixed guide articulator, which can produce some lateral and protrusive movements <laughs> just for an average, like an average um, setting. Therefore, if the average movements of the articulator match actually the movements of the patient, uh, that means we are in luck, so we can have a successful case. These kinds of articulators are used extensively as, uh, you know, sometimes they are very successful for uh, cases where, like I said, um, they're kind of ideal cases. They're not too much to, the bite registration is correct. The patient has a lot of um, their natural dentition, so therefore it's easy for us to mount the case uh, in the articulator in the cor correct position so and to perform the the minimum type of uh, movement <clears throat> functionally generated chewing surface techniques aside fixed guide articulators should be used for cases where precise duplication of the la lateral movement is not critical so again this is mostly for cases that are very simple very direct and I don't recommend the non-adjustable articulators for any implant cases, even if it's just one single implant, because the movement of the jaw, it's very important how the forces apply over the implant are distributed. So having an articulator that, uh, articulator that uh, register all the movements of the patient's jaw it's very important because when we design the prosthesis, we have to keep in mind how the forces are transferred through the implant into the bone. <clears throat> the semi-adjustable articulator has enough adjustable features to uh, give fair to good simulation of a patient actual mandibular movements. Many articulators in this class can compensate for the angle of a person uh, articular 
eminence, horizontal and vertical up overlap conditions, and amount of progressive mandibular trans uh, translation or size shift. Some have fewer adjustments, no variable pro uh, pro progressive size shift, and some have more adjustments. So depending again, um, depending what we're using the articulator for, we have different tools that we can adjust. Some of the semi-adjustable articulators, they come with uh, more uh, gadgets that we can use to actually uh, mimic how the patient is, uh, um, you know, the oral function of the patient's mouth. Uh, these articulators are very versatile and the most frequent used in the dental services. They are used for making all forms of removable prosthesis and for moderately complicated fixed prosthodontics restoration. Some dentists use the most adjustable um, of the articulated in this group for complete mouth uh, rehabilitation. There are two ways or methods of using the semi-adjustable articulators, arbitrary or the average method. Only those patient factors that are more critical to the success of the case are reproduced in the articulator with the greatest accuracy possible. For example, the centric occlusal, occlusal the maximum intercaspation, and the occlusal and vertical dimension. Statistical averages are used to set up the remaining articulator adjustments. The so-called average settings are supposed to hold true for the majority of the patients. When a semi-adjustable articulator is used in this way, it becomes a fixed guide instrument and it has some limitations. The semi-adjustable method. The dentist articulates the patient case and sets the articulator adjustments based on the actual patient's measurements. Two kinds of measurement system are used, either a phase ball transfer or a maxillomandibular relationship record. A phase ball transfer is a procedure used to attach a maxillary cast to, onto the articulator in the same way the maxilla relates to the temporal mandibular joint. A phase ball is a dental instrument used in the field of prosthodontics. It's supposed to transfer the functional and aesthetic components of the patient's mouth to the articulator. Specifically, it transferred the relationship of the maxillary arch to the temporomandibular joint to the cast. It's very important when the doctor takes <clears throat> a Facebook transfer to use the same um, articulator system that we're gonna use in the lab for the, uh, for the case because <clears throat> Each articulator system, they have their own face bow um, transfer. So if a doctor uses, let's say, um, Stratus uh, face bow, and we're going to use a Hanauer articulator, uh, it's not going to help us because the system, they don't match. Okay, So we have to coordinate with the dentist what, what type of articulator um, we're going to use for the case. <clears throat> when the intraorbital canal is used as a third point of reference in the Facebook transfer, the maxillary cast is also related to the horizontal plane of the articulator, like the patient maxilla relates to the axis orbital plane. In other words, how the maxilla is sometimes, if you look at the patients, sometimes the maxilla can be a little bit tilted uh, on either the left or the right side. So <clears throat> by default, when we mount the case, we try to mount the case to be um, even, straight. But if the patient has a tilt in their mouth, then we have to copy that tilt. This transfer in combination with the maxillomandibular relationship record allows for the opening access of the patients to be transferred the, to the articulator, so being more accurate. Maxillomandibular relationship records. The articulator adjustments are set accordingly to the three-dimensional methods of measurement called mandible, maxillomandibular relationship records. There are two types of maxillomandibular relationship records. The first, 
<coughs> it's a template that relates the lower caste against the upper in the same way that the jaw relates when the, the record is made in the patient's mouth. <coughs> For example, centric relation. After the cast are mounted, the second kind of maxillomandibular relationship record, record is used to set the articular adjustment lateral and potricial records. Fully adjustable articulator. This category differs from the semi-adjustable because uh, of the feature that it has. And those uh, features and tools that this articulator presents allow us to custom made all the adjustments um, of how the patient moves. So we can uh, simulate the condyle guides, um, the intra, uh, intercondylar distance, um the lateral movement everything we can set up and customize exactly how is it in the patient's mouth the information needed to accomplish this highly refined adjustments that not, does not come from the maxillary mandibular relationship record it comes from the mandibular movement tracing on recordings um made by the patients under the direction of the dentist so this is a whole process that takes place in um, taking an accurate uh, transfer record that the dentist has to know how to use and to record this movement so we can use them in the fully adjustable articulator to mount the case correctly. Fully adjustable articulators are used on the most demanding kinds of cases um, and it's used to detecting uh, and treating patients whose jaws movements are not normal, okay? Or we want to change something. For instance, we have patients that they have a collapsed um, jaw because uh, they're edentulous and the, the cheeks and uh, the bone uh, shrinks and the cheeks, therefore, they can kind of suck in. So maybe the dentist wants to give the patient uh, a more youthful look and restore, you know, their uh, oral function to a better way for the patient to speak and also to masticate. So we can use, the dentist can uh, set up the um and they can set up all these records in the articulator and send it to us so when we mount the case we kind of went from what the patient have to something what the patient desires and it's more functional so this is for cases where um you know the patient has uh wear dentures and um, <clears throat> the the bone it's collapsed a fully adjustable instrument can be used in the fixed guide and semi-adjustable modes if a less uh, adjustable articulator is not available so in other words uh, this fancy articulator having all those uh, tools available if the patient is at average um, measurements then we don't need to set up all the measurements in in this articulator. We can use the average. Archon versus non non uh, archon. Some semi adjustable articulators and fully adjustable articulators are described as being archon in design. The word archon it's acronym for the words articulator and condyle. It describes those instruments having the condyle elements attached to the articulator's lower member in the same way as the condyles are in an anatomic feature of the mandible in a human skull. At the same time, the upper member of the articulator carries mechanisms stimulating the glenoid fossa of the maxilla. So therefore, the archon articulators are more accurate because they mimic the 
um, the jaws movement, the lower jaws movement, better than the non archon. What are the advantages of an archon articulator over a non, non archon? One advantage of the archon articulator is that they're anatomically correct, making it uh, it's easier to understand the mandibular movements. Another advantage is that the archon design is that the condylar uh, inclination is set at a fixed angle relative to occlusal plane. So we don't have to worry about it. It's fixed. We don't have to pingle with it. When the archon design articulator is open, the angle, angle between the condylar inclination and the occlusal plane remains the same. So we don't have to adjust that, all right? It's always more accurate. The archon articulator is more accurate. Perfect, perfect reproduction of uh, mandibular movement has always been an elusive goal. Once programmed, the archon articulator is capable of mandibular movements that are closer to the patient's own movements. This small advantage is so important that most articulators are designed as archon articulators. So how are we going to mount the case using a face bow? <clears throat> An occlusal rim is part of the face bow transfer apparatus for an edentulous or nearly edentulous maxillary arch. In fixed prosthodontic cases, a significant number of maxillary teeth are usually present, uh, and an occlusal rim is not often used. Instead, the dentist will cover the face bow uh, by fork with a uniform thickness of a base plate wax or modeling compound. Then the dentist will warm up the material and ask the patients to buy down. So the dentist uh, inserts the face bow into the patient's mouth and he makes sure that the bite fork is touching the uh, incisal and the occlusal surfaces of the teeth and he asks the patients to bite down. After the face bow transfer has been set to the laboratory, the maxillary cast um, it's set uh, using the face bow. So it's mounted. So we start mounting the case by attaching the face bow to the articulator and then inserting the maxillary cast into the bite, uh, bite fork of the face bow and mounting the case starting with the upper. Once we have the upper uh, set up and it's um, um, the stone is set and it's mounted correctly, then we can remove the face, face bow and mount the lower cast with the upper that it's already mounted. Um, the average method for semi-adjustable articulator so when we're ready to use a semi-adjustable articulator, always we have to, set, to, to check uh, and to set up um, all the uh, adjustments at the average um, settings. So set the condylar guides at 30 degree articulation. Um, <clears throat> Firmly secure clean mounting plates on both the upper and the lower frames of the articulator. Be sure the adjustable inside of guide table is in place on the lower frame and remove the inside of pin. Note that the occlusal plane is parallel to the horizontal plane of the articulator. Remember the scale should read plus 30 degrees. If for some reason, the occlusal plane has not been mounted parallel to the horizontal plane of the articulator. The set horizontal condor guidance other than plus 30 degrees needs to compensate for the amount of deviation. Set the horizontal guidance at plus 40 to plus 45 degree mark on the scale. Note that the lateral condor guidance equals 15 degrees. So all these, 
degrees that we see here, those are the average measurements and they have to be registered on the articulator, especially when we're using a semi-adjustable articulator. And everything has to be set before we start the mounting. So we look at the articulator, we set up <coughs> the condar guide at 30 degree, okay? We set up the horizontal guidance at 40 or 45 degree and make sure that the incisor guide table, it's at zero. So that table where the pin is, it's flat. And then insert the mounting plates and we ready to mount the case. Okay. <laughs> so like I said, when we're using a face bow, the face bow, it's attached. If we're using a semi-adjustable non-arcan articulator, the face bow is attached to the upper frame of the articulator. And then <clears throat> it's um, secured in place. And then, like I said, we're going to mount, uh, we're going to insert the maxillary cast on the bite fork of the face bow. We're going to mount the maxillary and we're going to let it set the stone the plaster stone to set and once it's ready we can retrieve the facebook from the articulator and mount the lower um, cast to the upper okay so this is the whole procedure <coughs> um mounting at a vertical dimension other than what the patient actually vertical dimension is and an estimated occlusal vertical dimension. So sometimes the dentist might ask us to open the vertical dimension, all right? This condition is characteristic of mountings made with intra-occlusal jaw relationship records of or bite registration. Um, <clears throat> so the bite registration it's a record um, and it's uh, usually done, it could be done with base plate wax or there are special materials for bite registration that are more stable than wax. So what the doctor does, um, it, it puts this um, bite registration material in the patient's mouth and he asks the patients to bite down and that material starts to set pretty fast. Once it's set, it, it removes the bite registration from the patient and he sends it to us with the case. So we can use that bite registration and put it between the upper and the lower cast. And then we can mount the case in the correct position because that bite registration gives us exactly how the patient bites. Uh, one thing all intraocclusal records have in common is thickness. So it's true that sometimes that material creates a little bit of um, opening because the thickness of material interferes with the occlusal contact. <clears throat> uh, and because they have thickness, they usually hold opposing teeth apart at the vertical dimension. And that opens up the vertical, okay? It's common practice to compensate for the thickness of the um, that um, of the bite registration before the lower cast is attached to <clears throat> to the mounting ring. <clears throat> um, the thicker the inter or uh, occlusal record of the bite registration, the greater need for Facebook transfer because the Facebook uh, face bow transfer is the most accurate um, record of the patient's bite, okay? How are we going to mount a case in, uh, if we do the case digitally, if we're using CAT-CAM? 
So everything starts with setting up an order. We always have to make sure that we set up the order correctly, and especially for implant cases, uh, we have to make sure that we select the implant system and the implant size that it's the one that doctor use for the patient. Then we can scan um, the cast using a scan flag and um, we can move on to um, designing. But all the digital system, the CAD CAM system, they have a way to include uh, articulation into the software. So we, we have the same way of customizing um, the restoration to fit and to function perfectly in the patient's mouth as we do it by hand. It's the same way with the, uh, the digital software. So after we set up the order, the next um, step will be to use a scanner to scan the case. Uh, majority of the desktop scanners um, they can accommodate even a semi-adjustable articulator to scan. And this is very important because using a semi-adjustable articulator, we saw that actually we record a lot of information from the patient's movement of the jaw. So scanning the case in a semi-adjustable articulator, it's very important because it transfer those information from the cast, physical cast, into the digital file that we can use for design. Also, very important, after we finish the design and we working on doing the adjustments for uh, occlusal contact and all the uh, movement, uh, register of the movement of the patient's jaw, we can use a virtual articulator to see if there are any interference into the occlusal uh, contact. So there are virtual articulators that are, we have a library into um, the software and the library can also be uh, adjusted and add a different type of articulators. So in general, majority of the companies that uh, the big companies that they do articulators they are now actually have a digital uh, component so um, the same parameters that we're using for uh, physical um, articulators we can find them in the, the digital uh, component and like i said this is very important especially for dental implant cases because we have to make sure that there is not too much pressure or force applied on the implant um, when the, the patient uh, bites, right? So this is critical. And again, it's very important if we articulate the case correctly, we can see that uh, the design that we do, in this case, it's a design for uh, custom abutments. We can see where the custom abutment needs to be reduced and also how we can um, <clears throat> use the tools in the software to adjust um, the, uh, the articulation. Um, All right. So another thing that it's uh, very cool with the CAD CAM system is uh, when we're ready to, let's say, print the models. Uh, again, the software provides us with um, some type of articulation. So we can print directly the models with uh, this type of articulation. Uh, and it's very easy to work with and they're very light. And it's good because we already um, scan the, the models into uh, occlusion. 
So we use the byte registration, so we, we know that this is very accurate. Okay. So <clears throat> this is how the model work uh, looks like with um, <clears throat> a printed um, model that has an articulator. All right. So <clears throat> a very important step, and it's very important to understand what kind of articulator we're using for what kind of job and what um, we should do to maximize the <clears throat> tools that the articulator give us to mimic and to copy exactly the patient's uh, oral function. It's critical, especially for implant cases. If you have any questions, please ask them during the lecture. Thank you.